Hello, this is a lecture that I did yesterday at Bosch Kent University, but I didn't do it so well, so I'm going to do a redaction of it now, just for the record. It's about my teaching methods and how they've changed over the years. I first came to Bosch Kent, Turkey, in 1989. I had been teaching then quite for about 10 years beforehand, mostly with a bunch of kids during the vacations. And in the term times, I would end up doing private tutoring for money. That was quite an interesting job because I had a sheer variety of students. And the thing I learned actually was to try to get to know them. <coughs> Nothing <coughs> personal in that is, but something to do with the more I knew about them, the more I could advise them. When I came to Bill Kent, however, I was quite intimidated by the size of the classes. 50 students in two classes in the first year, 30 students in the second year, and 30 students in the third year. And I remember going to ask the then head of department what I should do as far as teaching was concerned. She said not entirely seriously, make sure you teach them about life in an English pub. <clears throat> I, didn't, <gasps> I didn't quite know what that actually meant. <clears throat> so I resolved to teach them literary texts. And I remember the very first text I gave them was the importance of being earnest. That wasn't the most obvious text to do because although written in modern English, its wit was such that it was way past the levels of the students. So having started badly, I then went back again and went to easier texts such as Shakespeare. Now you may say, Shakespeare, but surely that is written in Middle English. But you can work through the speeches quite easily in lecture form. That was something one of my professors did at Exeter, and I reproduced his strategy. However, I have to admit that by five or six years in to my career, I was getting somewhat bored with lectures. Why? Because I'd be doing the same lectures and the students wouldn't be getting involved much at all, except when I threw out coded discussion questions which usually had the right or the wrong answer. So I started teaching in group work at Hajitep University with a bunch of graduate students. I worked part-time at Hajitepe for my pains, it was very good actually, I was given graduate students to work with. Now graduate students, for the most part, were accustomed to reading and talking about their reading, so I could assign texts and other materials which they would bring into class and start talking about. However, I refined my technique over the two years or so, three years or so, when I did it. And eventually, I was getting the students to do most of the talk themselves, with myself only intruding if I wanted to. So it wasn't too much talking to do. Admittedly, teaching British cultural studies at that time was a blast and mostly quite fun because I worked with John Abanaza from Hajitepe University, God rest his soul, who happened to be a most terrific entertainer as well as a good teacher. And when we did it together, when I felt like a rest, he could take over. Then I switched from Hajitepe and Bill Kent to Bosch Kent in 2007 and worked for four years three years, four years, four years in the American Literature Department. 
That was a reasonable thing to do. But I only really discovered something about myself when I moved from the American Literature Department to my current department, the English Department. It was illness that occasioned the change. One of the problems is in 2011, 12, the cancer which I had way back in 2000 came back and came back bad. So bad in fact that it not only affected my thyroid gland but it moved down to my voice. I had a much stronger voice in the past. Now I had this particular voice and was only able to talk for limited lengths of time. I can still only talk for limited lengths of time without drying up or taking a glass of water. But the thing I had to do was to develop a way of teaching that would help my voice and also pass on the material of the lessons to the students. And these were all undergraduate students whose levels of English vary, sometimes very good, sometimes not so good. So what I did was, this is to undergraduate students, make them do the work themselves, set drama activities, set reading activities, and other activities, and ask the students when they said, what do I have to do? My stock answer was, I don't know, do what you want. They were quite disturbed by this. Most of the teachers in this particular culture tell the students what to do, and the students just do it. And there was this crazy Englishman saying, I have no idea what you have to do. You let me know. They discovered how to do it simply by doing what I asked them to do. The activ among the activities I asked them to do was to make their own uh, um, comprehensive activities and then use that experience to construct dramas of their own. This is another activity which for many of the students was something completely new. They'd never done it in high school and they'd never done it in university. There are problems with a technique like that. If you have groups of students, let's say five or six in a group, you're inevitably going to get one or two of them who are not going to do much work. They either can't be bothered or don't come to class or simply rely on the teacher to do everything for them. But this wasn't the case. Some of the students who worked hard in the group once again asked, what should I do? And my comment was, I don't know, what will you do? And again, the students had to work out a solution. They could bring the students in, but they couldn't rely on the students turning up every week to do the dramatic rehearsals. So what could they do? One of the best solutions I remember was that one group of students wrote a play, mostly for four people, with four supporting roles that could be added or got rid of, depending on which students turned up. The students who didn't turn up, their marks were low anyway, because I watch the classes all together and make notes, mental notes, on the students' progress or lack thereof. So if the students don't come to class, they just end up with bad grades. This is a much different way of looking at classes. The performance is not based on learning facts about plays or other literary texts, but based mostly on abilities. These abilities include things like personal abilities, being able to do this what I am doing now, to sit and talk to people, even if it's imaginary people like I'm talking to, or if it's a real audience. 
It's being able to use the face and the body in such a way that you can entertain an audience. Now, you know, I'm talking as I would in a conversation now, but I could easily go into a boring, lecturous conversation like this, which could end up putting people to sleep very quickly. I don't even move my features now. I can just talk about a text in this way. But as you notice, I try to move my head about as much as possible and put a smile with it. What else do they learn in this class? Well, they learn person skills. And these are extremely important, not just for literature, but for everyone in life. Person skills means being able to talk to one another and to be able to negotiate amongst each other. That's again quite difficult because most of these students have, although they know each other out of class, they're not encouraged to work together. So by being told to work together and reach a decision on their own, they have to negotiate and make a decision. I will only arbitrate if there's a complete impasse, but normally that's never the case. What else? I have to try and make clear that when it's group work, when I talk about a group working together, I mean a group working together, not one student telling everybody what to do, but all the students, those who are interested, as well as those, as those who are not, becoming involved in the creation as well as the production of the drama. This is again quite difficult, especially for speakers who of English who are not confident about their language. This is why in the group work stages when they're working together, there's no reason, I say, why they shouldn't use their own language to discuss things rather than my language. So long as they perform in English or Turkish, depending on what I want, that's fine by me. The next thing they have to learn is the importance of nonverbal communication. That doesn't mean just your facial gestures, as I'm doing now, but your hands as well. The best teachers always use their hands. I know I'm not using my hands now because I'm sat in front of a camera, but if at this talk were to take place in a lecture theatre, I would either fold my hands like that or start waving them about like a, like, like a demented parrot or something. So they have to use their hands, they have to use their bodies, they have to learn how to work together and they have to entertain. And I say that's the most important thing. If I'm not entertained and you're boring, then the students will be boring. So the most important thing you have to learn are the three important words. Don't be boring. These dramas are only incidentally connected to Shakespeare. But the point is not to make them close to what Shakespeare said, but to make people ready and understanding about the point of drama and why drama is an important skill they need to acquire, not just in class, but out of class as well. It's something which might be called a life skill rather than just a subject skill. And I think that's the reason why I do it in class. Because doing it this way, the students learn a lot about themselves as well as others. And also, quite honestly, it's such fun to do, I wouldn't do anything else. <laughs>